The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. The committee is holding this hearing to address the serious and growing crisis posed by natural disaster and extreme weather events driven by climate change. Between August 29th and September 1st, Hurricane Ida devastated the US from the Louisiana coast to New Jersey and my home state of New York. This deadly hurricane resulted in over 100 deaths, including 13 in New York City. In New York and New Jersey, more than a thousand miles from where this storm first made landfall, catastrophic flooding trapped people in flooded basement apartments and stranded vehicles. In Louisiana, Hurricane Ida took down the electric grid, knocking out all eight transmission lines that deliver power to New York, New Orleans, and downing more than 30,000 utility poles, nearly twice as many as Hurricane Katrina. More than 1 million people were left without power. Some are still without power more than a month later. The unprecedented destruction unleashed by Hurricane Ida is part of a growing trend that the federal government cannot ignore. From record-breaking fires in the West to devastating hurricanes in the South, to rising sea levels that threaten 40% of America's population near our coastlines, the destructive impact of climate change is rapidly escalating. And the cost of ignoring this problem is growing. During the first half of 2021, the United States experienced eight climate disasters with losses totaling more than $1 billion. Initial estimates put losses from Hurricane Ida at between 53 and $64 billion. The Government Accountability Office had climate change on its high risk since 2013, in part because of concerns about the increasing cost of disaster response and recovery efforts. Today, we are honored to be joined by FEMA Administra Administrator Deanna Criswell. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Administrator Criswell. I know you and your team are working around the clock to respond to the ongoing recovery efforts and other pressing issues. Your testimony is crucial today because there are thousands of people in New York, New Jersey, Louisiana, Maryland, and other impacted communities who are desperate for information about how to get help and when they will get help. That includes understanding what steps FEMA is taking to speed up the installation of temporary roofs on damaged homes in Louisiana and to work with vulnerable populations to make sure their applications are complete and approved quickly. I am also interested in hearing about FEMA's efforts to address inequities in disaster readiness and recovery. Vulnerable populations like renters, people of color, people experiencing homelessness and undocumented immigrants are more likely to suffer the consequences of extreme weather events, yet they often face the biggest barriers to getting help. The Biden administration has taken important steps to make it easier for disaster survivors to receive assistance, including waiving the requirement that survivors have a deed or other formal proof of home ownership to receive assistance. FEMA has also taken steps to assist vulnerable populations by developing fact sheets tailored to renters, undocumented immigrants, and non-English speakers. These are important steps, but more needs to be done. It is crucial that we invest in climate resilience and post-disaster assistance to advance racial and economic justice so that we do not leave behind our most uh, vulnerable communities. Administrator Criswell, I also would like to hear from you today about how we can improve efforts to build climate resilient uh, communities. One cri critical step the administration could take is to improve federal data on the full extent of climate change on our communities. By leveraging data across the public and private uh, sectors, we can better understand the future risks of flooding to communities and take action to keep uh, people out of harm, harm's way. Uh, Congress also must act. Today, I reintroduce the federal agency Climate Prep Act. This bill will ensure that communities have a say in how federal agencies implement their climate action plans, which is crucial in making sure our taxpayer dollars are put to work where they are most needed. Last week, I was proud to support the $28 billion for victims of Hurricane Ida that Congress approved, but I was disappointed uh, 
that 175 of my Republican colleagues voted against this bill, including many, many members whose constituents are in dire need of the emergency funding approved by Democrats. So I am hopeful that it, as extreme weather becomes more frequent and more deadly, we can agree on a bipartisan basis that impacted Americans deserve our help. But recovery funds are not enough. Congress also needs to make long-term investments to stop global warming before it is too late. That's why I call on my colleagues to support uh, President Biden's Build Back Better Act. This transformational bill will make essential investments to solve the climate crisis while also upgrading our infrastructure so that we can better prepare for future disasters. In the long run, these investments will save money by reducing the extraordinary cost from natural disasters and extreme weather caused by climate change. I now recognize my distinguished uh, uh, ranking member, Mr. Comer, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney. And I wanna thank the witness, FEMA Administrator Criswell, for her willingness to appear before the committee. I'm pleasantly surprised that the Democrats have finally called a witness from the Biden administration to testify before this committee. Maybe the Lugar Center will upgrade the F grade the committee was given earlier this year. Now, while I appreciate FEMA Administrator Criswell's testimony and look forward to hearing more about the agency's efforts to assist Americans impacted by hurricanes and other natural disasters, it's critical to mention who from the Biden administration that the Democrats on this committee have, re have refused to call to testify. Chairwoman Maloney, when will Democrats call Department of Homeland uh, Secretary Maracas to discuss the crisis along our southern border or Secretary of Defense Austin to explain the debacle that has been the Afghanistan withdrawal or someone to address the growing inflation created by the Biden administration that has gotten so bad that even stores like the Dollar Tree are raising prices on American consumers. In fact, Chairwoman Maloney, I've sent three letters this year urging committee Democrats to call a hearing to examine the Biden border crisis. Since January 2021, thousands of illegal immigrants, including unaccompanied minors, have crossed the southern border. There's an ongoing security, humanitarian, and public health crisis with no end in sight and no clear policy to address this issue from the Biden administration. As I've outlined in my letters to Chairwoman Maloney, one of the most troubling issues at the border is the number of unaccompanied children entering the border and currently in U.S. custody. To date, thousands of unaccompanied children are in U.S. custody. The Biden border crisis became so dire in March of this year that the administration was forced to activate FEMA to support the response for unaccompanied children. Over a period of 90 days, FEMA supported DHS and HHS to get unaccompanied children out of DHS custody and into HHS placements. That FEMA the agency charged with the mission of assisting American citizens in recovery from disasters had to be activated further illustrates the extent of the crisis created by the Biden administration's disastrous policies. Administrator Criswell, I hope that you can address my concern today with regard to the activation of FEMA to use critical resources reserved for American citizens faced with natural disasters to respond to crisis created by this administration at the border with regard to unaccompanied children. Chairwoman Maloney, I'd like for the FEMA administrator and members of this committee to hear directly from Mr. Higgins with regard to issues he and his constituents have faced with FEMA's response to natural disaster recovery in Louisiana. I understand there are still people waiting on critical assistance from FEMA and we look forward to getting answers about that. I will now yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins, to give an opening statement. I, I, thank, I thank the gentleman and ranking member, and I thank Chairwoman Maloney uh, for holding today's hearing. And, and thank you, Mr. Comer, for giving me a few moments to speak. Uh, while this hearing is focused on Hurricane Ida, I'd be remiss uh, to not speak on the ongoing hurricane recovery in southwest Louisiana. Just over a year ago, southwest Louisiana was ravaged by brutal hurricanes, Laura and Delta, back-to-back. -back only to be followed by severe weather uh, from winter storms and major flood events. Southwest Louisiana is appreciative of the $1.6 billion that FEMA and other agencies have delivered 
to help with immediate response costs, but this is insufficient for what's needed for long-term recovery. Hurricanes Laura and Delta alone have been estimated to cost one uh, sixteen billion in damage to the region, meaning we've we've delivered thus far about one tenth of of what's estimated the cost of Laura and Delta. Even with the passage of last week's continuing resolution, these funds are over a year late and fall short of the necessary federal response. The entire Louisiana delegation, including our governor, has written 14 letters to the administration and congressional leaders to get the funding out the door, yet the political realities have, have injured the lives of Southwest Louisiana citizens for over 400 days. And in closing, I would hope uh, Madam Chair, that although we can recognize intellectually, we may we may struggle as a body to uh, address what's been referred to as extreme weather. Perhaps the chairwoman would agree to to work with myself, my office, and and Republican members of the committee to deal with the extreme bureaucracy that we face. We could certainly address that, whereby uh, response to natural disasters across the country that affect Americans at one, at one time or another in a, a, a very negative way that we could work together to streamline the, uh, the, the bureaucracy and red tape that we face as citizenry at, attempting to recover. And, and Madam Chair, I yield, and Mr. Ranking Member, Mr. Comer, thank you for yielding me time. Gentleman yields back. I, I, I want to briefly... Well, who did an incredible job and a job similar to this one in the city of New York to answer all of your questions. Uh, she has been to New Jersey and other sites uh, to work with people and, and respond uh, with FEMA. And the truth is that this committee is uh, actively engaged in waste, fraud, and abuse. The committee has a joint investigation with the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis into the Emergent Biosolutions a firm that received huge vaccine contracts, but had to destroy millions of doses due to deficiencies in its manufacturing. Our bipartisan investigation into the F-35 Joint Strike Force fighter helped push Lockheed Martin to return $70 million to the Department of Defense's F-35 program to compensate uh, for defective spare parts uh, uh, again. And, waste, fraud, and abuse. This committee helped create the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee and the Committee of Inspector General overseeing the trillions of dollars in response to the pandemic. IG saved roughly $17 for every dollar spent. And we have not shied away from constructed over oversight of the Biden administration. In the last two weeks, we conducted oversight uh, of the treatment of Haitian asylum seekers held a classified briefing, which was the request of the minority on Afghanistan, and sent a bipartisan letter on the FBI's handling of ransomware attacks. Our oversight record stands in, str in strong contrast uh, to Republicans who turned a, a blind eye to four years of outrageous uh, abuses by the former president. With that, I'd like to get back to the critical importance of today's hearing. First, I'd like to introduce uh, our witnesses. Today, we are privileged to hear from the administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Deanne Criswell. The witness will be unmuted so we can swear her in. Uh, please raise your right hand. You swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Let the record show that the witness of answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and without objection, your written tes testimony will be made part of the record. With that, Administrator Criswell, you are now recognized for your opening testimony. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your public service in New York prior to coming to the federal government. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Chair Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, and members of the committee. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to testify about our response and recovery efforts following Hurricane Ida. 
as well as the longer term investments we must make to increase our nation's resilience in the face of climate change. Climate change affects every single American. It is the biggest crisis facing our nation, and it is making natural disasters more frequent, more intense, and more destructive. Mitigating the effects of climate change is one of my top priorities for FEMA. And Hurricane Ida has demonstrated the challenges presented by our changing climate, the benefits of mitigation investments, and the importance of equity in our response and recovery. Fueled in part by warmer than normal waters in the Gulf of Mexico, Hurricane Ida's wind speeds intensified from 85 to 150 miles per hour in less than 24 hours. This Category 4 storm became the fifth strongest hurricane to ever make landfall in the continental United States. Storms normally break apart quickly when they make landfall, but Ida remained a Category 4 storm for four hours. And Ida's impacts have affected states and communities from the Gulf of Mexico to the Northeast. Ida left a million people in Louisiana and Mississippi without power at a time of sweltering heat. After transitioning and accelerating to a post-tropical cyclone, Ida caused widespread flooding in northeastern United States, breaking multiple rainfall records and causing catastrophic floods in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Hurricane Ida caused over 100 direct fatalities, and my heart goes out to all of the families who lost loved ones. For all its severe impacts, Hurricane Ida was also notable in other ways. First, the storm came ashore 16 years to the day after Hurricane Katrina made landfall and caused widespread flooding in New Orleans. But this time, the levees in New Orleans held, reflecting significant investments made in the aftermath of Katrina to strengthen the levee system. Second, FEMA was well prepared for Ida. Thanks to congressional action in the 16 years since Katrina, we have authorities that give us the flexibility and the ability to lean in much quicker than we have in the past to bring the full force of the federal family into position so we can respond quickly. We pre-positioned millions of liters of water, millions of meals, specialized response teams, and numerous resources from our federal community to deploy based on the immediate needs after the storm had passed. At FEMA, we say that disaster response is locally executed, state managed, and federally supported. And I am proud of how well we supported our state and local partners in responding to this storm. This was particularly true given the special challenges involving, involved in responding to a disaster amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Third, as this storm hit the United States, FEMA was ready to implement important policy changes to help underserved communities, which are often disproportionately impacted by disasters, to obtain individual assistance to the full extent that they are eligible for it. Previously, homeowners may have run into difficulties proving that they own their homes if their property was handed down informally through the years. To address this, we have expanded the forms of documentation that can prove ownership including documents like receipts for major repairs or improvements, court documents, public officials' letters, mobile home park letters, and applicant self-certification for mobile homes and travel trailers as a last resort. In addition, FEMA has also changed the way it calculates the threshold for property losses to qualify for direct housing, such as a trailer or a mobile home. This ensures equitable damage evaluation regardless of the size of the damaged home. The recovery phase for Hurricane Ida continues as we speak, and we will be dealing with the consequences of this hurricane for quite some time. But even as we do that work, we must make the kinds of generational level investments necessary to reduce the impact of climate fuel disasters that we will face in the months and years ahead. Mitigation investments are incredibly worthwhile. An independent study by the National Institute of Building Sciences in 2019 found that every dollar in federal hazard mitigation grants invested in mitigation saves the American taxpayer an estimated $6 in future spending. At FEMA, a cornerstone of our mitigation efforts is the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, or BRIC. 
I would like to thank Congress for providing the legislative tools to create BRIC through the Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018. By establishing a reliable stream of funding for larger mitigation projects through a nationwide grant program, the BRIC program provides a critical opportunity for state, territorial, tribal, and local governments to invest in a more resilient nation, reduce disaster suffering, and lessen future disaster costs. Earlier this year, President Biden visited FEMA to announce that he was increasing the funding available for the PRIC program to $1 billion for fiscal year 2021 application period. These are the kinds of investments that will protect lives and property in the future of the, in the face of the future storms we're going to face. Another important element of FEMA's mitigation efforts is the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. In August, President Biden approved more than $3.46 billion for the HMGP program for the COVID-19 disaster declarations. As a result, every state, tribe, and territory that received a major disaster declaration in response to the COVID-19 pandemic will be eligible to receive sus substantial levels of funding to invest in mitigation projects that reduce risks from natural disasters. For eligible mitigation projects, HMGP funding can cover 75% of the total project costs, while states or communities cover the remaining share. We will be urging relevant agencies in your states to ensure that these funds are delivered to disadvantaged communities and would welcome your support in this effort. One more critical piece is the FEMA Flood Mitigation Assistance Program, or FMA which helps provide financial and technical assistance to states and communities to reduce the risk of flood damage to homes and businesses through buyouts, elevation, and other activities. Flooding is the most common and costly natural disaster in the United States, and the direct average annual flood losses have quadrupled from approximately 4 billion per year in the 1980s to roughly $17 billion per year between 2010 and 2018. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, approved by the Senate in August, would provide $3.5 billion over five years for the FMA program. The Biden administration has urged the House to approve the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill without delay, and I would like to add my voice today in calling for its swift passage. Mitigation is particularly important for underserved communities that are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. In administering our mitigation programs, we will keep equity considerations top of mind and will include them in competitive scoring process for programs such as FMA. Equity is one of my top priorities at FEMA and the intersection of climate change and equity is of particular concern for our agency as the impacts are worse for our vulnerable communities. In closing, I would like to thank all of the first responders across our nation, our amazing FEMA workforce, and our interagency partners for their tireless work in responding to Hurricane Ida. They continue to answer the call to respond to disasters fueled by climate change, which truly is the crisis of our generation. The intensification of natural disasters will be our new normal, but this is a call to action and I look forward to continuing to work with Congress to make our nation more resilient. I would be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you, thank you very, very much for your service and for your testimony today. And I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Administrator Griswell, I know that you visited New York City with President Biden and myself uh, after Hurricane Ida and saw firsthand the devastating loss and suffering it brought uh, to New Yorkers. As the former commissioner of the New York City Emergency Management Office, this is the office that rebuilt New York after 9-11, an incredibly important uh, position, you know how unusually intense Ida's rainfall was uh, for New York City. It overwhelmed drainage systems and caused a flash floods. Uh, 11 New Yorkers drowned, they drowned in their basement apartments. Divers had to had to retrieve uh, bodies, including a two-year-old toddler. Uh, you can see on the screen a picture of what remained after one basement apartment was flooded. And when we looked at, up the addresses of the five homes where New Yorkers died on 
FEMA's flood map, uh, I was surprised to find that all of them are located in areas marked as having minimal uh, flood hazard. So administrator, I understand that FEMA flood maps are intended to be limited tools and provide information on some flooding risks, but not all. But is it true that local emergency responders sometimes use FEMA maps to determine which residents should be evacuated and what areas to prioritize after a flood? Yes or no? And Chair Maloney, thank you so much for the question. And my heart goes out to those families who lost loved ones due to this event. Um, as you stated, our flood maps are designed to be tools that account for coastal inundation as well as river flooding, um, and they do not take into account uh, the storm sewer systems. As you saw, we had a record rainfall in New York, which was broken by the re previous record, which was just a couple of weeks before that. Um, and it's a sign that our infrastructure um, has an opportunity to be upgraded and mitigated against so we can prevent future flash flooding urban events like this. And these are the types of projects that are eligible um, under our hazard mitigation programs. Um, we're going to to see these severe rain events across the country. And so we need to take action now to help mitigate the effects of these types of events. Uh, that, that, that is great. And I'm sure that uh, the localities uh, will be uh, applying for it. Uh, and we saw that the storm water and drainage systems were overloaded in New York, probably across the country too. Uh, will you commit to updating flood maps in, in New York City to better reflect local limitations such as storm water and drainage systems? Uh, Chair Maloney, the flood maps are community maps, and uh, we will work with all communities to help the updating their maps with the information that they have available so we can make them more accurate. Great, great. In addition to updating maps, does FEMA provide funds to communities to upgrade stormwater and drainage systems so that, that they are more resilient uh, to the flooding, such as what we saw with the Ida and extreme water weather? Yes, some of those upgrades are certainly things that could be eligible under our hazard mitigation programs. I mean, I would encourage communities to check with their hazard mitigation specialists to see if they are eligible under that program. And, and we saw in Hurricane Ida the crucial importance of investing in infrastructure before a hurricane hits. Uh, you noted uh, New Orleans has a special system to reduce uh, storm risk, which includes raised uh, levees and fortified flood walls. This helped protect New Orleans. Uh, uh, New York City also invested in protecting waterfront areas vulnerable to storm surges and sea level rise after Hurricane Sandy. But Ida brought a different challenge with more than three inches of rain per hour, far more than New York's 100 year old drainage system can handle. How, how can FEMA help New York and other cities assess the new climate risks that we're facing now Will FEMA give advice to cities uh, across our country on how to become more resilient to extreme weather? Yeah, I think you raise a really great point, Chairman, in that, again, the levee systems are designed for a certain type of event, but as we continue to see more and more of these severe rain events that are gonna happen across our country, we need to start thinking about the future res risks that our communities are facing. And so we do have technical assistance um, that we would be happy to work with local communities to help better understand what their risks are today and the future risks that they're going to face. And my time is running out, but, but uh, Administrator, do you agree that it's important that federal agencies, including FEMA, plan ahead for the next disaster and that local communities have a voice in that plan, which is like the PrEP bill that I'm introducing today? I think it's critical that we continue to plan for what the future disasters might be instead of always focusing our efforts on our historical events. Um, as we've seen this year, it, it's going to continue to change and we're going to continue to be faced with more severe events. Uh, thank you so much. And I now recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, which was very hard hit. Mr. Higgins is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. And before I begin my statement and questions, I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce several documents for the record. In the interest of time, six of them are local articles, media articles detailing FEMA's actions in my district and South Louisiana. Uh, one is an official FEMA document discussing NFIP risk rating 2.0 changes Without for objection, Louisiana. All are accepted. Without objection, you, all are accepted. Thank you, thank you, thank you, good lady. 
Administrator Chris, well, thank you for being here today and for visiting Louisiana in late August. Uh, let me clarify that virtually every public entity, including Calcasieu Parish School Board, Cameron Parish, Jeff Davis Parish, the Port of Lake Charles, and the City of Jennings have numerous public assistance applications still outstanding from the 2020 hurricane season. This delay in funding has real-world consequences that force the small and local government entities uh, to, to attempt to fund recovery efforts from their very slim margins of, of revenue and to leverage state bond funding and other revenue streams. The fact that over a year after the initial incidences that these cities and towns are still waiting on the public assistance reimbursements that they qualify for, or in some cases, even to have FEMA inspectors come and appraise the damage a year later. It's shameful. Administrator Chriswell, as a Biden administration official uh, to participate in oversight hearings, and uh, and the first is Congress, I, I appreciate you being here. I look forward to our discussions with FEMA's response to the 2020 and 2021 disasters is an issue within itself, but our overall federal response is always seemingly late. While politicians and bureaucrats discuss the need for better mechanisms to respond to these disasters, the answer is definitely not to create more bureaucracy. The bureaucracy we have is, is slow and thick. As we discuss potential changes to federal programs to better respond to future natural disasters, meeting the citizens' needs should be our top concern. An increase to focus on timely responses between the federal government and state and local entities, that's, that should be primary. And, and better coordination and proactive efforts are needed. Administrator, Chris, well, I wrote to you on August the 10th regarding Calcasieu Parish School Board's public assistance applications. This is an example of the bureaucracy that we're frustrated with from FEMA. The school board has two category A, 21 category B, and 82 category E projects currently outstanding. This is from a storm a year ago, ma'am. While some of these applications have been approved, there's very few. Most of the requests are still outstanding. Jeff Davis Parish has $2 million worth of requests. His he's, he's, he's parishes don't, cannot afford to carry that for a year for programs that they qualify for. Additionally, regarding FEMA's 50% rule, the Port of Lake Charles has submitted multiple projects in order to receive funding and has yet to receive one validation or determination from FEMA. Administrator, can you explain why this school district, for instance, local governments and others like it in my districts have had to wait, in some cases over 300 days to receive reimbursement that they clearly qualify for? Is it a funding issue? Is it because of inspectors or is it due to bureaucracy, ma'am? Congressman Higgins, um, I certainly appreciate your advocacy um, for the, your constituents there in Lake Charles. I mean, we discussed this uh, previously on the Committee on Homeland Security. Um, and following that, I did make a trip down to Lake Charles. I visited with um, Mayor Nick Carter to better understand some of the struggles that he has been experiencing. And I brought my senior leadership team with me so they could follow up directly. Um, some of the things we learned brand new during that visit, and my team has been following up on it. Um, I don't have the specifics on the school district that you mentioned, um, but it's taking too long is what it sounds like. And so I commit to you that my team will continue to work with the representatives there to make sure that we're moving this forward as fast as we can. Um, I thought that we had made some progress after that visit, um, but I will follow up and make sure that it's continuing to move forward. I thank the administrator for her candid answer. We will communicate directly with you and your office, ma'am, uh, with further details and specifics. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I thank you uh, for holding this hearing today, and my time has expired, so I yield. Gentleman yields back. The gentle lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, is now recognized for five minutes. 
I uh, thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair, for this hearing. Uh, as you indicated in your remarks, this was uh, this this hurricane was felt in the Northeast as well. Fortunately, the District of Columbia, my district, was spared. But Administrator uh, Criswell, we see a rising number of uh, natural disasters. I think that's because of climate change. And, and therefore increased reliance on the federal government. Uh, your own National Advisory uh, Council uh, has indicated that the public assistance program most benefits communities that can afford to pay the required match and can navigate the complexities of the contracting agencies. So my question is what actions is FEMA taking to assist existing disaster recovery and mitigation programs to ensure outcomes are more equitable for all communities, including those that cannot afford to pay the required matching funds? Uh, Congresswoman Norton, uh, thank you for that question. You know, as all of our programs um, always have opportunity for some improvement. And since I arrived here, um, I have uh, worked with my team and directed them to take a people first approach. Um, and remember that we can't have programs that come in with a one size fits all way of applying our programs. We have to be able to understand the needs and the unique needs of individual communities and individuals themselves. And bring our programs to them instead of forcing them to always maneuver their way through the bureaucracy. Uh, we made several programs going into this, or several changes going into this hurricane season um, in order to improve the equitable delivery of our individual assistance program. This is just the beginning. We're gonna continue to look at ways that we can reach our communities more equitably, understanding that I've seen firsthand how our underserved communities who already have difficulty are more disproportionately impacted after a storm has passed. And so you have my commitment to continuing to work at our programs to find ways that we don't always go with this one size fits all approach. We understand the unique needs of individual communities and individuals. Thank you, Administrator Criswell. Uh, indeed, GAO has noted that some communities simply don't have the technical staff engineers, grant managers, uh, the necessary capacity, in other words, to submit a complex grant application. And as GAO has recommended that FEMA create a centralized inventory uh, of hazard mitigation resources on the FEMA website. Has FEMA developed a, a, an inventory of resources yet? Uh, what we have developed is our mitigation action portfolio, which provides examples of mitigation projects that have been done across the country that can help communities better understand the type of projects that could be eligible. I'm not sure if that's exactly answering the question on resources, and if it's not, I'll certainly look into it and see exactly what you're talking about. Um, but I would also like to say that um, we also provide technical assistance. We understand that not all communities have the ability to hire somebody to come in and write a competitive grant application, which is why we're doing directed technical assistance through our new Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program. We offered this to 10 communities during the first round, and we've doubled that to 20 communities. And I've been working with our state partners to help identify those communities who need this type of assistance the most so we can reach those populations that would otherwise not try to apply for this type of assistance. Administrator Criswell, uh, thank you for that. Uh, the uh, GAO uh, has published a report in which it notes the complexity of the application process. Uh, the the timeliness to grant awards and the technical capacity required to, to successfully apply is a problem. What specific opportunities has FEMA identified to simplify or shorten the application process? 
Um, again, there's there's a couple of ways that we can help communities with this. One is through technical assistance, right? That's one of the key ways that we can help communities better understand how to navigate some of the complexities. Um, but with other programs like our assistance to firefighter grants program, we have uh, shorter applications um, for smaller amounts um, that can help get those through quickly. But there's always opportunities for us to improve. And I have asked my grants um, section here to take a look, an overarching look at all of our grant programs to get a better understanding of where we are missing some communities and then understand what the barriers are for them trying to reach out and ask for assistance so we can address that root cause of the problem. Mrs. Julie, Mrs. time has expired. I welcome the, I welcome the, uh, the opportunity for technical assistance. And of course, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Norman. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney and uh, Administrator Criswell. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to address your answer to uh, Congressman Higgins, but before I do that, you know, Ms. Criswell, you talk about crisis. Uh, we've got a crisis on the border. Uh, in seven months, we've had over 170,000 illegals cross the border. Uh, it's a medical crisis and it's a military crisis. We've got an inflation crisis. Ask any American who's paying 40 and 50% more for gas from foreign countries who don't like us if that's not a crisis, along with the food and everything else that's inflation is hitting. Uh, we've got a military crisis in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, we've got 13 dead Marines. We've got Americans left behind. We've got crises and this administration has simply not addressed them. Chairwoman Maloney, as, uh, as has been mentioned, we've sent three letters uh, on having uh, testify before us different people. Why is Mayorkas not appearing before the, to answer questions? Why is General Milley, uh, Austin, Blinken not before us answering questions? Why is Janet, Janet Yellen? not here answering questions. This administration has simply put this country in a, in, in a crisis mode from the day it took office. Uh, but that being said, Ms. Criswell, in response to, to Congressman Higgins, in all due respect, ma'am, it's just words. If you were in the private sector, if you could not give the kind of answer that you gave. Uh, this is, we're two, two months, three months shy of 2022. He asked you questions about 2020 that has not been addressed, and you said you would address specifics, but why the delay? Uh, Congressman Norman, recovery takes a long time, and it's complicated. And when you look at an event like Hurricane Laura, followed by Hurricane Delta, there are a lot of comp uh, complicating factors that that make it even longer to recover. Uh, we are working as fast as we can in coordination with our state and local partners to assist with their recovery efforts. And there's a number of things that we can do to help speed that up. We yeah, can do- Ma'am, ma in, in all due respect, has his, when he when you received a request dating almost two years ago, was was his, was his Louisiana responded to the specific questions? Did, did your agency respond to each one of them? Um, I don't have the specific of a, a letter received two years ago prior to my administration, um, but I know that we have addressed the requests that I've gotten since my time here in office. And you've been there how long? Um, I started at the end of April. And you would have looked over past requests to see where it was and why it had the money hadn't been released. Uh, I'm saying in the, if, if this had been in the private sector, you'd, you would have had a problem. Uh, my other question to you, President Biden rescinded the proclamation declaring a national emergency at our southern border. If the crisis at the southern border is not an emergency, as Biden proclaimed, then why was your agency, uh, <clears throat> the Federal Emergency Management Agency, deployed to the southern border? Congressman, FEMA is really good at coordinating across federal agencies. It's one of the skill sets that we bring to the table, and it's one of the things that we do best. And in this case, we were asked to come in and help coordinate um, and support our partners at HHS and CBP. We had a very limited role. We no longer have a presence in supporting that mission, and it's just done through now through our normal um, interagency uh, inter uh, avenues. How much money has been expended for, for the limited role that you say that FEMA had? Um, I don't have the exact dollar amount, but all of the funding that FEMA would have incurred has been reimbursed by those agencies. 
All right, could you get that? I mean, could you get the numbers for us? Uh, and could, could you report on uh, why you were there, the dollars that were spent? Are you still there? Uh, we have nobody that is supporting that mission directly. It's all being supported through our normal interagency venues. Okay, and is there any other outstanding issues with other states uh, that your agency either needs to respond to or hasn't responded to? I'm sure I would have to know specifically what types of events you'd be talking about, but to my knowledge, you know, we're still managing recovery from disasters across this country. Um, and so we will continue to support those disaster response and recovery efforts. Okay, and you led off with, um, with the fact that, you know, climate change is, is um, you know, uh, you know, overriding issue. Uh, I, and I guess money is no object for combating crime, climate change. Uh, are you aware of a study the, of MIT that said if every nation complied with the Paris Accords, they would only redu reduce carbon emissions by 0.2%? Sir, I am not aware of that study. Okay, that's another thing. Could you take a look at it and give us your thoughts on it and give us some idea of what, um, if that's true or not? That's a pretty pretty big uh, statement for them to make, and they're not a some fly-by-night agency. <laughs> The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, is now recognized for five minutes, Mr. Conley. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you so much for having this hearing. And Administer uh, Criswell, welcome. Um, and um, I must say my friend, uh, just uh, Mr. Norman just talked about crises when the Biden administration began, and he's absolutely right. The Biden administration inherited endless crises from the Trump administration. I mean, everything from an insurrection at the Capitol uh, to uh, a pandemic that was made so much worse by the response or a lack of response by the Trump administration and by the president himself, Mr. Trump. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, if we want another crisis, FEMA. We just voted for a continuing resolution and $28 billion in natural disaster relief and 175 of my Republican colleagues voted against it. So M Director, uh, Administrator Criswell, if your budget had been zeroed out, as apparently some of my colleagues would have it, would that have created a crisis for you? And could it create a crisis for America in terms of preparedness for disasters and response to disasters? You know, Congressman, I do appreciate the passing of the continuing resolution so we can continue to support um, the American people. You know, any disruption in funding to our mission would certainly have an impact on our ability to protect the lives of individuals that are faced by disasters. So let's be a little more specific. Thank you for that diplomatic answer. But let's you're the you're the administrator of an agency that actually does nuts and bolts relief and recovery and you're the lead federal agency for responding to natural disasters. Uh, I don't know, uh, has the frequency of hurricanes uh, reaching land in, uh, uh, on continental uh, United States uh, increased over the last decade? Congressman, what we're seeing is the, is the number of hurricanes, the number of wildfires, the number of severe weather events continues to increase. They become more severe, more intense. They're uh, intensifying more rapidly. Um, and that's only going to continue to get worse. So I was, I was looking at some interesting data. In 2017, three hurricanes uh, of uh, you know, magnitude three or four hit continental United States, which I believe was the first time that's happened. And the cumulative damage of those three events that affected Puerto Rico, Texas and Florida was $265 billion, a record. That's the largest disaster cost, costed out in American history. Um, and the question is, given climate change, are we, when you do your planning, what do your experts tell you, Administrator Criswell? Should we expect more or was this just a fluke and we're out of the woods? Congressman, I think what we're seeing from the impacts of climate change is that we can expect to see more events like you just mentioned, which is why it's so important right now that we start to think about what these future risks are going to be. And we invest in mitigation projects so we can reduce the impact financial cost of these disasters. 
And, and are you also working with states, uh, Administrator Criswell, to do more resiliency planning? You know, flooding is more frequent. Uh, uh, tidal surges are bigger and more dangerous and damaging. Uh, we've seen it even in urban areas like New York where the subway system now floods anytime there's any kind of major storm uh, because the tidal surges and the rise of ocean level are now affecting places like Manhattan um, and shutting down subways. Uh, are those events you're planning with local governments and state governments uh, in terms of resilience? And if so, can you tell us a little bit about it quickly? States and local jurisdictions are required to have hazard mitigation plans, which address some of the concerns that you talked about. Um, and FEMA does provide assistance, again, through our technical assistance program. And we also fund the development of those plans through our hazard mitigation grant programs. And what we need to do is work with them closely to think about, again, what are these future risks that you're going to face? So the next iteration of their hazard mitigation planning is thinking towards the future and what are the crises that our children and our grandchildren are going to face so we can better protect against them. Thank you. My time is up. I yield back. And yields back. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Keller, is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Keller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, natural disasters and flooding poses enormous risks to our homes, businesses, crops, and infrastructure. They also jeopardize the safety and well being of Americans nationwide. I think we can all agree that flood protection and prevention are essential tools to mitigate damages caused by severe weather, such as hurricanes, tropical storms, and heavy rainfall that have the potential to decimate communities like the ones all across Pennsylvania, all across our nation, but particularly in the area that I have the privilege to represent, uh, Pennsylvania 12. Events like Hurricane Ida and other storms that took place this year underscore the need for our communities to remain resilient when challenged with these storms. That all starts with investing in disaster protection. In Pennsylvania, the Williamsport Levee is the second largest flood control project of its kind. The system protects central Pennsylvania from catastrophic flooding of the Susquehanna River. The levee system originally completed in 1955 is in desperate need of repairs. The 2020 Water Resources Development Act named the levee as a priority and Lycoming County's 2018 County Comprehensive Plan update calls uh, the state of the levee system, quote, the single greatest threat to maintaining and pursuing economic resilience. Um, uh, Commissioner Criswell, uh, or excuse me, Administrator Criswell, thank you for being here today. Uh, I understand you have experience with emergency management in the Northeast having served the state of New York previously. Uh, and, and in many cases in New York, there's plenty of uh, river towns uh, like, like that here in Pennsylvania. Do you believe, uh, uh, what do you believe are some of the most pressing disaster related needs for communities like uh, like the one I represent uh, in Williamsport? Congressman, I think the example you gave is, is a really great example of really understanding what our current risk is and looking at the age of our infrastructure. We have to understand whether or not the infrastructure that was built decades ago is still adequate to support the extreme weather events that we're starting to see and will continue to see moving forward. I think it's critically important for all of us, and we have a shared responsibility to look at what we can do to upgrade current infrastructure or also improve the mitigation projects that we have so they can reduce the risk, reduce the impacts from this increase in the number of weather events that we're seeing. I guess I, I agree with that. And are there ways we can streamline items in the project delivery process for investments in priority flood protection projects like the one, like the one in Williamsport? Um, I don't know the specifics about that project, but I think that there's always ways that we can work together to try to streamline the delivery of projects. Um, if there's something specific on that one, I'd be happy to have my team get back with you and see what we can do. Uh, I appreciate that because they're, they're, you know, looking back to 1955, you know, uh, we want to be able to lower the risk and severe damage um, from a process standpoint. And that's really what we want to look to do. Uh, the, we certainly need that flood protection here in central Pennsylvania or around our nation because it does protect uh, homes, families, uh, businesses, uh, 
and, and, and it's so important from that standpoint. So if, if there are things that we can look at and we can do, um, you know, to, uh, to lower the risk of severe damage uh, by having a streamlined process, uh, you know, I'd like to, like to be able to work with you and your team on that. For, again, it will benefit the areas I represent, but also uh, many of the people uh, in Congress. Uh, we certainly need that help. So anything we can do to, to, to help that along, we're, we're willing to work on that. Absolutely, Congressman. I'll have my team get back and, and see if there's anything specific we can do. Thank you, because again, you, you mentioned that the, you know these these mitigation projects have you know were completed uh, before I was born, actually 1955. Um, but I, I've I've been in the area a long time, and it's so important that we protect, and that's really our job as as people who work for the individuals uh, that pay our salaries, whether we're in Congress, whether we're at FEMA. Uh, you know, that our responsibility is to, to the people of the United States of America, and we need to make sure that their money is being invested to protect their interests. So I appreciate the time to be here today. I appreciate you uh, being with us, Administrator Chris Well, and look forward to working with you and your team on these important issues. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Mfume, is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Mfume. You're muted. Mr. Mfume, is he there? Let's go to Rokana. Okay. The gentle uh, lady from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairwoman. And thank you so much to Administrator uh, Criswell for not only joining us today, but even recently coming to visit uh, so many of our communities in New York, as well as across the country who are so deeply devastated by Hurricane Ida. Um, and also for, in addition to that, uh, your flexibility in implementation of our COVID funeral fund program, uh, which has helped families all across the country help recover from the devastation of the pandemic, in addition to some of the, the other natural disasters we've been seeing across the country. Uh, Chairwoman, I would like to seek unanimous consent to submit a record, uh, to submit to the record a full testimony of one of my constituents, uh, Deluara Ahmed, regarding their experience post Hurricane Ida. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Deluara, uh, alongside many others, wrote to my office, quote, I looked out the window and saw cars uncontrollably adrift uh, during the Ida floods. A woman waiting waist deep in the street, people yelling for help. These are some of the images uh, that we saw across the district. And I strongly believe that FEMA can play an active role in mitigating an experience like, uh, like theirs. Now, earlier this year, Administrator Criswell, you told the New York Times that the risk we are seeing from climate change are the crisis of our generation. And I think that you're right. When we look at the numbers after doing some digging, uh, according to the agency's data in 2005, there were 48 major disaster declarations. That was in 2005, 48 dis uh, disaster declarations. Now in 2020, there were 104 major disaster declarations, more than double that number. Um, now, the climate, the climate Research Commission by the city of New York projected that in 2015, the number of days with rainfall of at least four inches would increase by as, as much as 67% by the end of the decade. Um, and that's compared to the period between 1971 to 2000. Is FEMA operating and planning ahead with similar projections for the climate crisis? Congresswoman, um, thank you again for, you know, hosting me in New York City and being able to see some of the impacts that we saw um, or that people experienced from Hurricane Ida, completely devastating to many of those, those individuals. And I think, you know, the, the data that you just mentioned, what that highlights is the thing that I'm stressing here is that we have to stop um, focusing all of our efforts on historical risk, the historical risks that we've faced in the past, 
and look to our future risk and better understand what that future risk might be. Um, that's hard to do because it's not tangible. You know, you can you can put your finger on what happened in the past and build to that. Um, but we have to be able to be comfortable with understanding the potential for the future risk and the investments that it's going to take in order to protect against that future risk. And so I am committed with my team to working with locals as they are upgrading their mitigation plans, as they are looking at what their future risks will be and to help them better understand what that future risk, that future threat from climate change is going to be. Thank you so much, Administrator. And if you could list some of the measures, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is that as climate change gets worse, the way that we're going to have to approach not just disaster response, but disaster prevention is really going to have to evolve with the increasing threats that we have. And that includes our approach um, within FEMA. And so my question for you is if you could list some measures that would aid or assist in shifting FEMA's role in responding to more frequent natural disasters, what would some of those measures be? Is it more funding for staff? Is it a kind of increasing into or growing into disaster prevention, a streamline response measures during disaster relief time, internal reorganizations, you know, from your bird's eye view, what are some of the things that we need to know on the congressional side, whether it's the potential for expanding authorizations, et cetera, that you see is going to be necessary in the coming years and decades? It's a great question, and I think there's two things that I would talk about um, right now. And one, we used to see a very cyclical disaster response cycle where we would reset in the winter time and get ready for the next disaster season, and we don't see that any longer. Um, our team has been working hard, and now they are working year-round to support the different types of weather events that we're seeing, and that's just going to continue. And so we are taking a hard look at how do we now create a year-round disaster workforce that can keep up with the demand of the disasters that we're seeing. But I think the only way that in the long term we're going to continue to be able to keep up with this is reducing the impact so we don't have to respond as much. And the way we do that is through mitigation. And so we need to continue to educate communities about the importance of reducing the impacts, putting in community-wide mitigation projects in order to protect their citizens. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. The gentlelady yields back. The gentlewoman from New Mexico, Mexico, Ms. Harrell, is recognized for five minutes. Ms. Harrell. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I really appreciate this um, hearing. And I just want to kind of piggyback on something um, that my colleague, uh, Congressman Norman, said regarding the border. Um, just, just because it is such an important part of this entire process, but we know um, that there is a crisis at the border. And we also, it's worth noting that 458,000 people came into our nation illegally in the year 2020, but yet over 1.5 million have come in this year so far. So I don't think that this current administration inherited a crisis at the border. I think he created a crisis. But with that being said, um, Administrator, I would like to know, are there policies or decisions that have been made by this administration that caused a crisis on the uptick in the crossings on the southern border, the illegal crossings? Congressman uh, FEMA's or Congresswoman uh, FEMA's role is to support the response to um, disasters. Um, we do not get involved in policy regarding immigration. Um, I would have to defer you to the secretary. Okay, and thank you. Um, and can you just quickly give a couple of examples of how FEMA was able to help provide HHS um, and, and others support to move the children, the unaccompanied minors, um, out of uh, border protective custody? Uh, yes, ma'am. Again, one of the things that FEMA does so well is helping to coordinate interagency efforts in large, complicated structures. Um, and we were able to put a process in place that helped them be successful um, in managing that mission. It's how we manage um, any of the events that we respond to as far as just helping with the process, helping with the flow, putting the organization in place that can facilitate the decision making and setting benchmarks to set standards um, and goals that we wanted to achieve. Through that, we were able to reduce the amount of time that migrant children were in custody um, and the amount of time that they were um, spent with uh, HHS. Great, thank you. Um, and then just going back to um, some of the services, this is just more for clarity. And I know people don't think of flooding in New Mexico, but actually we had a large amount of rainfall in some of our areas throughout the district. Um, and this is just for clarifying, some communities and counties believe that they cannot 
uh, ask or apply for FEMA grants unless the state declares that specific area an emergency. Is that correct? Or are there programs where counties and communities can go directly to FEMA? Congresswoman, I'd have to understand more of the specifics. Um, they can't apply for public assistance grants unless there's a state declared disaster. Um, but our ha hazard mitigation grant program, like the BRIC program and the flood mitigation assistance program does not um, require a state disaster declaration. And then there's also, um, there's also our preparedness grant program. So I'd, I'd have to know specifically which types of grants that they're talking about. I'd be happy to have my team follow up with you. I, I would really appreciate that because we have a lot of very small communities that were hit very, very hard and they don't have the, they don't have the income, they don't have the, um, um, the ability uh, to re do some of these repairs, but it's, a, it's, it's affecting everybody in those communities, but it's not big enough to be called a state disaster. So, and I would welcome you to come to New Mexico uh, to look at some of our rural communities that have been hit. You know, you just don't think of flooding in New Mexico, but it happens and it's devastating for those that live in and around those areas. So I appreciate all of your hard work and the invitation uh, is open. So um, thank you very much. And if you could have your people reach out to our office, I would really like to maybe push some of this information out to the district that I represent. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you for the offer. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, but I would like to respond to your earlier comments. Uh, Although we do not want to be distracted from today's uh, topic at today's hearing, I do want to note that migration across the border did not start under President Biden. It started long before his presidency and this Congress. And the cruel child separation policy of the Trump administration did nothing to address the root causes uh, of the problem. Uh, but this is a, a very important hearing on FEMA and its response to Ida. So I would now like to uh, call on the gentlelady from Michigan. And Ms. Talib, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, much, Chairwoman. And thank, thank you, Administrator, for being here. I was really impressed uh, in the years of service that you've had uh, within FEMA and, of course, um, as a firefighter for, oh, I think, over two decades. Very impressive. Thank you, Chairwoman, um, for holding this really critical and important hearing. I know when I talk to my residents, they're not talking to me about the broken immigration system when they're saying, can you get the sewage out of my basement? Or, you know, Rashida, literally there's a river in front of my home. So I want us to really focus on the fact that we haven't invested, I think, the critical amount of money, the kind of bold, meaningful investment that we need to really address the fact that we have a climate crisis in our country. But Administrator, I do want to talk to you about something really serious, and I hope that under your leadership, there are changes can be made. As you um, noted in your testimony, flooding is the most common costly natural disaster in the United States. I've seen it. Um, my folks have been flooded, I think, four times just in the last two months. Um, and your team on the ground here have been leading with compassion, and I can't express to you how much that means to me, uh, representing the third poorest congressional district in the country. Uh, these are folks that did not have any savings, any anything to really um, uh address again, they had no safety net to address the, the, the flooding in their homes and of course damage to their homes. But you know that every five years FEMA is required to update their flood maps, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And it has to reflect, you know, whether properties are at risk of flood damage and flood maps are critical tools, as you know, to where where major decisions are made about investment, um, where folks need flood insurance, uh, where critical infrastructure is built. Who gets evacuated during a flood emergency, as you know? So last year, I know FEMA official testified during a hearing in the House Science Committee that FEMA's flood uh, maps may give false impressions to some communities that they have little to no flood risk. We're already seeing that with, uh, you know, FEMA officials on the ground can tell you and attest to that administrator. We know that new data released by an organization called First Street Foundation, which uses data to provide flood Flooding risk levels for individual properties shows that 8.7 million more properties are at risk from a 100-year flood than what current FEMA maps show. And there's been other level, you know, other kinds of reports afterwards. But you know, this is serious, and I'm just anything I can do to be a partner in this. But does FEMA plan to update its data and you know the method that they use to include forward-looking climate projections and its flood maps, such as heavy rainfall and sea level uh, rises levels? Congresswoman, uh, thank you for the question. Um, and you represent my home state of where I grew up in Michigan, in Manistee, Michigan. Um, so it has a very soft place in my heart. 
Um, flood maps are an incredible tool that we have, um, and again, designed primarily to support the inundation that we're seeing from coastal flooding or riverine flooding. Um, they don't necessarily reflect the, 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 uh, the rain events that would cause some of the urban flooding that we see. Um, but we work with the communities to help them update their community flood maps um, as they need to. Um, and we would be happy to work with communities to help incorporate additional data um, that they may have to, to better portray the risk that they may be experiencing. You know, and I appreciate that, Administrator, but I think we need to go farther in providing the capacity needed. Many of them are not know, you know, don't have the know-all know -all in regards to that. I don't know if it's been a priority in pushing the state to maybe provide that capacity, but we are, you know, at a point, I think, in our country that we need to start thinking about how do we do some of the, um, I think, preventive measures in place to making sure people have that safety net, that they are covered uh, in regards to flood insurance, in regards to the infrastructure implementation. And I say this sincerely, I, you know, my local communities were not prepared for this flooding and I can't, I don't know um, how I can go back to them now and say, hey, I need you all to, to figure out, you know, what are the tools, what are necessary in regards to figuring that out. If that makes any sense at all, look, I'm a social worker at heart and I, I'm a person that understands, um, you know, some of them are local communities, some of my larger cities may have more capacity, but my smaller communities, the 11 that I have that were impacted directly by flooding, really don't have that capacity. And I really think FEMA, we need to step up and we need to look at these foundation and these reports that are coming out and say, let's let's put some of that data point in there in regard to sea levels, in regard to where we've been seeing flooding. And I think we have a really important responsible role in not saying, let the locals do it. And I know I hear that a lot and it's something, again, I'm learning, but, uh, you know, administrator, please, uh, I'm, I'm asking you, let's change that culture and let's not, um, you know, kind of wash our hands in regards to the flood mapping. I think we have a role here and there's enough information out there that says we, we can do more. Yeah, I think um, what you speak of really um, amplifies what I've been saying is this is the crisis of our generation. And we all have a shared responsibility to make sure that we are better understanding what the risks are that we're going to face in the future. I mean, so yes, we have a lot of work to do and FEMA has a lot of work as well to support our communities and helping to understand what those risks are. Uh, the gentlelady yields back. The gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Administrator, Administrator Criswell, it's, uh, it's good to see you. And I would really be remiss if I didn't start off by thanking you so much. Uh, you and your incredible team, you personally, Tom McCool, who could not have represented FEMA better, uh, nor done more you know, hands-on work than uh, anyone could um, during the Surfside disaster in my congressional district. Um, as you know, we're still dealing with that crisis. Uh, families uh, have been torn apart and are in crisis. And um, I, I appreciate the, the, the president's quick reaction, your team's help, um, but just would ask um, for an opportunity to talk with you because there are some things that we continue to need to sort through. Uh, and I, I just have some questions. So if we can follow up afterwards, that would really be helpful. Absolutely, ma'am. But primarily, thank you. Thank you so much uh, on behalf of my community. Shifting to, uh, to Hurricane Ida, which made landfall in Louisiana. Um, and that was a category four hurricane. And then quickly became, as we've discussed this morning, one of the most devastating natural disasters in US history. And being from the state of Florida, I'm obviously quite familiar with, uh, with an ex the experience of the impact of natural disasters and the af aftermath. But in this case, over the course of 24 hours, Ida strengthened from a category one to a cat four storm. Winds increased to 150 miles per hour, leaving so many people as we've heard today in Louisiana, unable to safely evacuate. And that's a, a story that my constituents in Florida are all too familiar with. As the storm moved across the southeast, up the mid-Atlantic to the northeast, as we know, its intense rainfall brought dangerous conditions to the communities in its path. I want to show on the screen um, a picture of the flooding in Louisiana and the flooding in New Jersey. So my, my, my first question is really just, can you underscore why Hurricane Ida caught so many people off guard? 
Uh, Congresswoman, I'll start with the fact that it intensified so rapidly. As you stated, it went from just a tropical wave into a Category 4 hurricane um, in a very short amount of time. And this is what we're starting to see more often. And it's giving our state officials less time to be able to put their plans in place where they normally, um, you know, had several days to put those plans in place. And that time frame is continuing to get shorter and shorter as these storms intensify more quickly. Yeah, uh, and, and, and that, it, it feels like that, that window of opportunity is, is shrinking so quickly. In New York, although the area was bracing for the storm, the city was unable to predict the severity of flooding that would hit. And FEMA does have an integrated public alert and warning system that works in connection with our local alert authorities to send out warnings and other alerts related to disasters. As the storms came through, emergency alerts blared through cell phones and warned residents of dangerous flash floods that they should head for higher ground and stay out of floodwaters. One of those alerts said, and I quote, this is an extremely dangerous and life-threatening situation. Do you believe that that system and other warning systems worked as intended for Ida? Are there steps that FEMA or local governments can take to improve the way information is shared about the risks of a pending disaster? Because this was the first time that New York had ever issued a flash flood emergency. Uh, our IPAWS system is an excellent tool that really helps to warn individuals across the country for a variety of disasters. Um, and it has worked successfully across the country. I think when you're in an area that you haven't had to use it before, um, it, it's hard to really understand what the significance might be. And so I think we all have a lot of work to do to continue to educate our communities when we're doing our public preparedness um, campaigns about the importance of when you do get an alert like this, um, that you need to take it seriously. But at the same time, we also have a lot of work to do to continue to educate our communities about what their risks might be. Um, so they know when it, something happens, what are your unique risks to you where you live and what type of alerts should you be um, looking out for? And then just one last question, um, because there are so many long-term strategies that we need to take, but investing in climate resilience is definitely one of them. And as a senior member of the Appropriations Committee, I always use my position to push for greater funding for the Weather Service, the Hurricane Center, programs like the National Mesonet. How does FEMA work with NOAA and the National Weather Service to get the scientific data and forecasts and translate those into public warnings? And is there more that can be done to encourage residents of our most vulnerable communities to prepare for storms or other severe weather events? At NOAA and the National Weather Service and the National Hurricane Center are such amazing partners of ours. And, you know, we have a morning daily operations call that they are part of to let us know what the current threats are. But we also work with them and we're working really closely with NOAA right now as they're trying to identify what the future risks from climate change are going to be to develop tools for local communities to better plan for what these uh, impacts are going to be so they can put the proper plans in place. Um, so we will continue to work closely with them to try to develop these types of products so that we can get additional information into the hands of these communities. Thank you so much. And Madam Chair, thank you for having this important hearing. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing. And um, it's well documented that natural disasters exacerbate inequality. Communities of color are disproportionately vulnerable to the harmful effects of flooding, wildfires, and tornadoes. Moreover, people of color are more likely to die from the negative effects of climate change. When Hurricane Ida struck New Orleans, predictably, Black Americans and non-white communities suffered the brunt of the devastation. Hurricane Ida is yet one more example in a long history of poor, marginalized communities getting disproportionately hurt by natural disaster. That's why when it comes time to rebuild in the wake of a natural disaster, the federal government should prioritize rather than deprecate historically marginalized neighborhoods. It's common for many black families to hold title to what's known as heir property. When a property owner dies without a will, their home and land uh, is passed down over generations to their heirs and land, land title becomes cloudy. 
because of an array of racist policies in the past, Black Americans, particularly in the South, were precluded from the legal system and unable to obtain deeds and titles to their land. How is FEMA meeting the needs of historically oppressed communities who are unable to abide by existing guidelines which were designed to exclude them? And what changes have been made to ensure that those who can't show clear title to their homes can receive disaster assistance from FEMA? Congressman, you raise such an important question, and it's something that when I came into office, um, I started to hear about, and I knew that we could do better. And so I challenged my, my team here to see how we could better provide assistance to survivors, and we made some significant changes going into hurricane season to better um, help with the, F with the issues that you raise about air rights. I mean, and so what we have done is we have changed and expanded quite significantly the types of documentation that we will accept from individuals to prove home ownership or even to prove occupancy. Um, that can range from uh, paying your tax bill to utility bills, um, a statement from your landlord in a mobile home community, uh, a wide variety of types of documents that can be accepted now. Um, the other big change that we have done as well, and part of my effort to try to bring services to survivors, to bring our help to where the people are instead of making them come to us. In the past, um, if somebody didn't pass that verification through our online system or on the phone, we would immediately send them a denial letter. Now what we're doing is if they can't pass in that first step, if they haven't been able to identify the type of documentation, even with this expanded amount, we will still send a building inspector to them personally. And if they can see the type of documentation upon arrival, then they'll just check that off in the system. And so that has, what we're seeing in Hurricane Ida has increased dramatically the amount of people that have not had to go through the laborious process of trying to appeal their determination that they did not own the property or they were not a resident or an occupant in the property. This is just the beginning. We're gonna to continue to make changes for how we can equitably deliver our programs, meet people where they're at, and understand that we can't have a program and a process that's a one size fits all approach. Thank you, uh, Ms. Criswell. Uh, Georgia has the sixth highest population of renters and ranks among the top 10 for states most at risk for a natural disaster. And, um, Renters um, applying for assistance through FEMA have to go through a very long process before they can get assistance. What's being done to reduce the wait period for renters who are displaced? I think, Congressman, some of the things that um, may have delayed their process is, again, being able to prove that they are occupants or renting a, uh, a certain residence. Those are some of the changes that we made to our program. Um, if there's anything else that's specific that um, you're aware of that's slowing down their process, I'd be happy to have my team get with you to better understand what the challenges your constituents are facing in Georgia. All right, thank you so much for your testimony today and for your actions in streamlining the process so that more people can receive assistance. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cloud, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Administrator Criswell, for being here today. Uh, I come from a district that was dramatically affected by Hurricane Harvey. Uh, and so we've spent the last four years working to help our communities recover from that. Uh, I know today's about Ida, but I think some of the lessons we've learned from FEMA or some of the questions we have certainly uh, would be applicable to any disaster that we're dealing with. And so um, wanted to thank you for appearing here today. One of the uh, issues I wanted to ask about was uh, the definition of resilience. One of the major issues Congress intended to address in the Disaster Recovery and Reform Act of 2018 was that under the law at the time, the public assistance program was designed to assist communities rebuilding. Uh, and to rebuild back to, at the time it was to the precondition of what it was and what we found ourselves was kind of in a loop where uh, we would rebuild to a standard that would not withstand potentially the next storm. And so uh, Congress, di Congress directed uh, that, that we begin to rebuild toward resiliency for future uh, disasters. But uh, 
there was supposed to be a rule for what resiliency met um, that was to be defined by April 5th of 2020 and final guidance for 90 days after that today that has not been issued. Could you let us know uh, in writing within the next 14 days or so when we can expect uh, that rule to be finalized? Uh, so we have the cr critical definition of resiliency. I know some people are, are having their claims denied based on resiliency, but that that term is still left un undefined. And so uh, could you uh, commit to get us a, a timeline for that? Congressman, I'll have to get with my team, but yes, I commit to getting you a timeline for what the status is on that. Okay, I, I really appreciate that. That would be a big help. And, and one issue that has uh, been, uh, you know, probably an, uh, an issue for decades, it, it would seem, you know, but for a long time has been just the staffing and the turnover. Um, I know many of the people in our district, some are on there in the matter of four years on their 12th program delivery manager. Uh, it's made dealing with these applications very, very difficult. Uh, the, for example, the Rapirio ISD superintendent wrote us a letter saying, as you're aware, the rebuilding of the school facilities has been slow, tedious, and frustrating. Two Rapirio ISD employees, the district's architect, and I've spent nearly four years daily navigating the FEMA process and to date have received only $382,488 of the between the $15 million and $20 million in damages with 12 program delivery managers cycling through our case. This has been an ever, <laughs> never, there has never been an opportunity to really make any ground. And, and so uh, I've heard of similar cases. Oftentimes we've had a, a, a recovery or a, a team come and do a site visit at a particular site. Seven different teams, for example, come up and show up. Um, will there be, do you foresee any sort of solution or, or what's FEMA doing to deal with the employee turnover or at least to deploy the the employees we have for a longer term and all or for a longer term uh, in the, in the field. Uh, Congressman, I appreciate your insights, uh, you know, and, and part of it is, especially when we're talking about four years, um, there will be some change in staff um, as we go through the years and these complicated projects that you're talking about do take a long time to get through the recovery process. Um, but I understand the concern um, as a previous local emergency manager, um, how frustrating it is when you have to start over and explaining your story um, and, and where you're at in the process. Um, I will work with my team um, to figure out if right. there's a better way to, to provide greater consistency for your folks down there um, as they're continuing their recovery process from Harvey. Well, well thank you. And um, do, you, do you know if there's been any sort of report on, on how, you know, it would seem to me that we're taking a much longer time processing these claims and that there's kind of a built-in uh, waste, uh, a built-in cost uh, increase in recovery due to some of the staffing issues and how we're deploying them. And uh, I would be very interested uh, if FEMA could look into that and maybe provide a report to us on, on what we can do to, to streamline that. Not only will it provide better customer service, so to speak, but it would also, I, I think, help us be much more efficient with taxpayer dollars uh, in administrating the, this recovery program. So um, is that something that you all could work on? Uh, yes, Congressman. I think anything we can do to improve the customer experience is worth our research. And so I'd be happy to have my team look into that. Gentlemen's okay, well, thank you. Expired. Thank you so much. And now the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me now? Yes, Good. sir. Um, all right. So, um, so Administrator Criswell, thank you very much for your um, intense focus uh, on this civilizational emergency that we're in. It's clearly a code red for humanity. And as President Biden said, in touring the damage of Hurricane Ida, the nation and the world are at peril. Um, we are seeing an increasing frequency of uh, natural disasters, but also an increasing destructive velocity of the natural disasters that are coming. NOAA began tracking billion dollar extreme weather events in 1980. Since then, 
uh, they have visited more than $1.975 trillion in damages on the country. Um, and here's the amazing thing to me, between 1990 and 1999, the average number of billion dollar extreme weather events was five per year. But in the last five years, between 2016 and 2020, as you can see on this chart, that number has jumped to 16 per year. So the number of extreme weather events has tripled just in the last two decades. Now you've made climate risk reduction one of your top priorities. Um, what is FEMA actually doing now to measure our progress in efforts to reduce the risks posed by climate change? Congressman, that, that is such a uh, important graph that you showed, and it demonstrates how we are now in the crisis of our generation, that the climate crisis is going to continue to get worse. And I think that we'll continue to see that number of billion dollar disasters only increase as we go further. Um, we are investing in mitigating and reducing the impacts. Um, the president has authorized close to $5 billion this year to help communities reduce the impacts that they're seeing from climate change. And we have to continue on that path forward. Um, it takes a long time for the mitigation projects to get completed. And so we have to continue to work with our communities to better understand their risks and ensure that we're getting this money in the hands of those people that need it the most. Will you help me understand this? When we say mitigation, what are we talking about exactly? Are we talking about the kind of things that my friend Congressman Higgins is talking about, which is the aid that comes after a disaster is hit? Or are we talking about readiness, about getting ready in advance for knowing that you know, there will be another hurricane coming to hit Lake Charles soon? It is a combination of both. Our Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program is pre-disaster mitigation funding. Um, but our Hazard Mitigation Grant Program is funding that's available after a disaster, but it can be used for any type of risk that they're facing. It doesn't have to be directly related to the incident that they had just experienced. Um, what we have to do is help communities understand the best way to make these community-wide investments to reduce these impacts from future threats. Um, I want to ask you a, a rather odd question, Administrator Cruz. Well, I want to ask you about polarization and division in American society. I know that's not directly under your jurisdiction, but in some sense, I think that FEMA can be the place where we bring America back together. Do you agree with me that the risk in extreme weather events, both the, the new frequency of the events and the extreme velocity of these events, should be bringing people together across geographic lines, sectional lines, political party, and ideology lines. And related to that, um, uh, extreme weather is obviously the problem being caused by climate change. But as uh, my friend, Mr. Higgins says, there is a problem of extreme bureaucracy that Americans have complained about from the beginning of the Republic. And we want to make sure government is working for the people. But there's also a problem, isn't there, of extreme propaganda and extreme denialism around climate change. And can't we all gather together through the good work of FEMA, through uh, hurricane and disaster readiness to bring the country together? Is there a way that this can be the source of unity for us? Congressman, I think that we all have a shared responsibility to help ensure that we are protecting our nation from the risks from future events so our children, our grandchildren, and future generations will not have to go through what we're going through now. Disasters don't discriminate where they're going to land. They're not red or blue. And we do have a shared responsibility to work together to make sure that we have the environment that we need to support our, our future generations. Right. Well, I appreciate that very much. I thank you for your hard work. And, uh, you know, th there was an attempt to say that the disasters that have been inherited by the Biden administration were caused by the Biden administration. I was glad uh, my friend, Mr. Conley from Virginia, corrected that. I will resist the opportunity to say that the entire last presidency was a disaster and hope that uh, the situation we're in will bring all of us together as a country. I yield okay. back to you, Chair. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grossman, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Grossman, you're recognized. Okay, then hand me somebody else. Yeah, here I am. Can you hear me? Uh, you're here. Okay, good. Okay. A um, couple general questions. You know, one of the criticisms always is 
the degree to which are we are we rebuilding or uh, you know rebuilding the same areas again and again and again? And I wanted your general opinion. Do we have a problem here in that uh, you know some there's some building going on in areas that you could anticipate we're going to have a problem again in the next ten years? Yeah, Congressman, I, we we need to take a concerted effort at making sure we know where the risks are and people understand where they, if they choose to build in a place, they understand what the risks are going to be and what potential impacts might be. Uh, we need to help provide that information and educate our population at what on what those risks are. Well, so I, I think I think the thing I'm looking for is. Is it reflected in premiums? Are we doing something to make sure that if people are in uh, particularly precarious areas that we are not rebuilding there? Are you doing anything along those lines? Um, what I can say is that our new risk rating 2.0, certainly the risk of where people build is reflected in their, in their insurance premium in a way that it hasn't been before. And so those that are in greater risk areas um, will have a higher premium. Uh, on the other side, in my district, and even back in my days as a lawyer, we always felt that there were people who did have very high premiums and just subjectively looking at it, there's no way anything was going to happen there in 100 years. But for whatever reason, lack of common sense or whatever, um, they were considered to be in the floodplain. Are you doing anything in which some people are peeling off from that or not? I don't know that I completely understand your question. Okay. As I understand it, they require flood insurance if you're in a floodplain, correct? Correct. And there are areas designated floodplain that, you know, you can talk to somebody, they go back to their grandmother who never remembers ever any floods in that area or close to floods. Nevertheless, somebody, when they drew the line, said this is a floodplain. So they're stuck paying for this insurance on something that everybody in the area believes will never happen in a million years. Has Have you guys over time taken to, into that account and tried to remove people from floodplain uh, who perhaps were erroneously put in it over a period of time? Congressman, again, I think that goes to the, the new release of our risk rating 2.0, where it takes an individual homeowner's particular risk into effect. And so if somebody does not have a risk that they were paying for before, then their rates would go down. I, I understand. I mean, the question is, have you peeled anybody out of floodplain that in the past was considered floodplain? Um, I'd have to get back to you on the specifics, but as our flood maps are updated, um, those types of data are incorporated into the risk premiums. I'd be curious. I'd like to get back to me. Now, I, I think Representative Higgins has a uh, very interesting question, a spellbinding question. Representative Higgins. I yield I, my I thank, I thank the gentleman for, for yielding. Ma'am, uh, regarding risk rating 2.0, respectfully, members of the Louisiana delegation have written several letters to your, your, your agency, and it, this may predate your service, and I respect that, but, but would, would like some answers on this. The quote from the from a FEMA document stated that 97% of current policyholders' premiums will either decrease or increase, increase by about $20 a month under risk rating 2.0. We know this is not true. We're seeing example after example after example of extreme variances in uh, policy expense, sometimes going from maybe 500 a year to two, three, four, five, seven thousand a year. Is there some in incredible disparities between the reality of the implementation of risk grading 2.0 and what was expected and projected and communicated by FEMA as that, as that legislation was passed. So I ask, can you respond to that, please, uh, it, to this committee, like formally, and can we get a commitment from you today that FEMA will consider uh, delaying the implementation of risk rating 2.0 until we get solid answers about that the realities of, of 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 what it really means to American citizens that carry uh, that carry national flood insurance program policies. Uh, Congressman, time has expired. The, the gentleman's time has expired. 
you may answer his question. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Congressman, um, we can certainly get back to you with any of the specific information, um, but risk rating 2.0 has been implemented and already um, individuals are seeing decreases in their insurance rates, um, which is the first time that this program has taken equity into account to make sure people are paying for the risk that they have. Okay. Gentleman's time has expired. He yields back. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Bush, is now recognized for five minutes. Ms. Bush. Hey, Lewis, and I thank you, Madam Chair, for convening this important hearing today. Hurricane Ida was yet another graphic example of how unprepared our nation is for increasingly dangerous climate disasters driven by fossil fuels. For communities like mine that have already been hurting for decades, we do not have the room for these new challenges of flooding and heat waves and more. Like those that were destroyed or severely damaged by Ida, our community faces more and more climate risk every day. Administrator Chriswell, numerator, uh, numerous FEMA disaster programs are not targeted to those in greatest need. Poor program design combines with unequal access to resources to worsen every single climate disaster that hits this country. For example, when FEMA conducts damage assessments after storms, they are measured based on property ownership. This focuses relief programs on wealthier parts of a community as opposed to the renters and unhoused neighbors most in need of support. Similarly, the National Flood insurance program only supports people who can afford to buy flood insurance, almost precisely the opposite of how this program should work. Transforming this program would mean saving lives. FEMA's relief program that is available immediately after a disaster is out of reach uh, for frontline communities. FEMA's National Advisory Council described their program as being, and I quote, more accessible to those with time, income, and access. Thank you for being vocal about your commitment to improving equity and FEMA programs. I was very, very glad to see the recent change in FEMA policy that would allow Black families in the South who did not have a formal deed or proof of home ownership to access disaster assistance. Um, but can you explain how this policy change will uh, specifically help Black, Brown, and Indigenous families? Yes, Congresswoman. It's so important that we don't um, overcomplicate the system that is already complicated and that we don't try to use, again, this one size fits all approach because everybody's situation is specific to them and unique to them. And it's so important for us to make sure that we understand that and that we put people first. The changes that we have made so far, we're already seeing big improvements in the number of people that are deemed eligible for our programs, meaning that they didn't have to go through that laborious process of trying to appeal what we would have normally denied. These are only the beginning of the changes. We're continuing to look at our program. So the air rights, the property ownership is just the start. We're going to continue to see where have we taken this cookie cutter approach and need to adjust it so we can better understand the unique needs of specific communities as we deliver our services. And I'd be happy to work with your team um, on any suggestions you have and things that you've seen. Thank you. Well, it's an excellent policy change that we know will benefit many people. We need to expand it to St. Louis, my home and across the country as we develop further fundamental reforms to problematic FEMA programs. Um, what other examples of changes that FEMA has made or intends to make that will improve equity and disaster relief. Can you give us some examples? I think the other um, example that I would give um, is that we also changed the, um, the cost threshold for determining whether or not you would be eligible for direct housing. We used to have a fixed dollar amount for that threshold, which left many homeowners that had a smaller amount of damage ineligible for our program. And so now we've changed that to a cost per square foot, which is really starting to affect um, our lower income populations. And so they become eligible for our direct housing program. Again, just one small example of how we've taken this cookie cutter approach that we've done in the past and made it unique and specific to the individual's needs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Biden administration also launched an important initiative by selecting two of FEMA's pre-disaster programs to be piloted under the Justice 40 program. Justice 40, for the, um, you know, is the whole of government effort to ensure that federal agencies work with the states and local communities to deliver that minimum of 40 percent of the overall benefits to frontline communities. The
the stakeholder engagement plan and plan to maximize benefits are among those supposed to be that are supposed to be developed already. So how will engagement with impacted disadvantaged communities inform your assessment? Uh, we are very excited to be part of the Justice 40 initiative, and it's part of our BRIC program and our uh, flood mitigation assistance program that we are incorporating that into. Uh, we have adjusted our scoring criteria to give greater points to underserved communities, and we're working with our state partners and through our technical assistance program to get the message out there and, and uh, reach out to our stakeholders so they understand the importance of having more individuals that are part of these communities apply for this type of assistance. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing where we can include this in additional programs in the future, um, but very much looking forward to seeing how the results of this round of our BRIC funding and FMA funding go. Wonderful. Jennifer, um, the gentle lady's time has expired. Thank you. Re regretfully, she yields back the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh. You are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome uh, Administrator Chris Well. Thank you. You, find a, you have one of the most important uh, jobs and we've benefited here in Vermont uh, during uh, Tropical Storm Irene with the extraordinary work that uh, FEMA did. So we're grateful. Uh, actually, what Jamie Raskin said too is something I think all of us feel at that time of need when FEMA shows up, it is something that can unify us, obviously a good thing. One of the, the, the topic I wanna discuss is the grid. It's not directly under your control, obviously, uh, but the breakdown in the grid and the challenges to the grid and the necessity for upgrading the grid um, I want to uh, ask about what the impact would be with respect to uh, the scope and scale of what you have to contend with after a big storm, an event like Ida. Uh, so maybe you could start by describing uh, what the impact was on uh, families and communities uh, after Ida because of the long-term uh, shutdown of the grid and how that impacted them and how it made the challenge you and your uh, folks at FEMA uh, had to contend with. Yeah, Congressman, uh, the, the power grid is so important to keep the communities moving and, and the sooner we can get the power turned back on, the sooner their recovery begins. And so what we see is that as it continues to delay getting the power turned back on, these communities have such uh, an increased amount of time for their recovery. Uh, what we saw during Hurricane Ida was hospitals having to be evacuated, communities having to be evacuated, um, and that all puts a toll on their on their families and on their communities. And so we need to be able to, you know, work with our, our private sector partners to help them um, get back online quicker if we can. But it's also an example of how our infrastructure um, in many places is, is so outdated, and we have to invest in improving our infrastructure so it can withstand this increasing number of of severe weather events that we're gonna to continue to see. So this uh, power outage situation that we faced in Ida, how long did that last in some communities? Um, I think that there's uh, some communities, some smaller communities that are still without power in Southern Louisiana, um, but many parts of the state, they were without power for several weeks. So just on a practical level, if a family can't go back to its house, they can't stay in the house once the storm subsides, that's an added burden uh, for the resources of FEMA to just help those folks uh, have shelter and food and warmth or cooling, whichever the case may be. Um, I wouldn't state that it's a burden for FEMA. That's the type of support that we provide to communities to help them during their recovery process. It's certainly a burden on the family that's been impacted, um, but we do have the resources and the tools necessary to provide that temporary lodging um, to assist them. Yeah, it, and you were good to correct me on the use of the word burden with FEMA because whatever the need is, that's your job. And I, I get that. Uh, but it does mean that the needs that that family has and that community has uh, are greater because they can't get back into their house and get things uh, uh, put back together, correct? Absolutely. And it just delays their overall recovery process, making it that much longer for them. You know, let me ask you about that because I think grid resilience and modernization is essential. But, you know, when we had Hurricane Irene, the families who were able to get back in, even though the house was a mess, there was mud there, they had to start digging it out. But my observation was that there was a lot of hope that they had that 
they're on the road to getting back to normal. Whereas if somebody's out of their home for two, not two days, but two weeks or two months, then that hope begins to fade. Uh, tell me whether that's a fair assessment in your experience. Um, sir, I would think that that is a fair assessment. Um, you know, people want to be able to start recovering quickly. And uh, when they are prevented from doing that, it causes additional despair for those families. Okay. I thank you very much for your good work, and I yield back. The gentleman from uh, Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, is now recognized. Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Administrator uh, Chris Wath. I really appreciate the testimony, as I know everybody does uh, today, and thank you for your uh, good and important work. Um, as you know, uh, Hurricane Ida, obviously, it did huge damage um, in many parts of the country, uh, but that included Maryland as well. On September 1st, it, it came through the state of Maryland and damaged hundreds of homes and businesses, um, unfortunately, even claimed the life of uh, a resident of Rockville, uh, Melkin Sadio. Um, I'm very grateful to the president um, and to you for granting the Maryland delegation's request to FEMA for federal disaster assistance uh, through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, which you spent a lot of time today uh, talking about. That was granted on September 13th. And last week, I joined the Maryland delegation in urging uh, the president to approve the state of Maryland's request for presidential disaster declaration for individual assistance to Anne Arundel County. Uh, which were hit by severe flooding and a tornado, in fact, uh, and hazard mitigation uh, grant program uh, assistance for all jurisdictions in Maryland, so that you know our residents, like like many others um, in these various states, can get the assistance that they need. Uh, this is federal assistance that's very necessary. It's warranted. I hope it can be expeditiously uh, reviewed and granted. Uh, but I want to talk about the grant program a little bit because, uh, as I understand it, FEMA provides for up to 75 percent. It's a cost share uh, situation. So um, the federal government uh, provides 75 percent of eligible project costs and then states and communities uh, cover the remaining share. Um, do you know... Has there been discussion? Do you know what the capacity is? I mean, obviously it's a budget dimension to it, but can you give us some insight into the potential for FEMA to increase the federal cost share to pick up more of the tab for the HMGP program, which would make it more likely that states uh, and localities who have budget crunches could respond to current disasters and better prepare uh, for future ones? Um, obviously it may not be critical in every instance, but there's going to be situations where communities um, are going to be either reluctant or incapable of accessing the program's benefits because of the cost share obligation. And I wondered if you could speak uh, to any kind of thinking or review on that on that front. No, oh, thank you for raising that question. The, the HMGP program is such an amazing tool to help communities, again, um, fight against this, uh, the risks that we're seeing and prevent future damages um, from these severe weather events. We I have heard from many um, people across the country that they do have a struggle meeting the cost share requirement. Uh, that cost share requirement is uh, set forth in the Stafford Act, and so that's not something that we can change. However, um, I, I think that there's work that we can do to figure out how we can help communities partner um, and try to find other funding sources that perhaps could be available to help them with that. And I, you know, I'm gonna be meeting with state directors um, to have this same conversation of how do we help communities take advantage of this critical resource um, so they can start to invest in their future risk. I appreciate that. I mean, any, any recommendations? I mean, if there, are, if there has to be statutory changes there to make it work better, but any recommendations that you can offer us based on the data that you're, you're gathering up from across the country that may show uneven opportunity to um, take advantage of the hazard mitigation program, I think would be uh, very, very helpful. And again, I just wanna thank the president for committing a historic amount to this uh, hazard mitigation fund 
uh, I think about three and a half billion dollars to reduce the effects of climate change, which we know are, is the most pressing factor uh, in all of this. You know, Annapolis over the last 50 years has experienced an incredible increase in nuisance flooding, um, which closes roads, it overwhelms stormwater drains, damages infrastructure. Um, it's, it's one of the most extreme impacts we see in the country. In fact, today, Annapolis expects over 50 flooding events every year now, up from an average of four annual flooding events just uh, 50 years prior. So we're very focused on this. Thank you for your good work. Uh, thank you for recognizing that climate change is this huge impact that we have to um, both uh, prepare for and have resilience for, but obviously take proactive steps to, to curb that trajectory. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Okay, the gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for convening this uh, important and timely hearing. Uh, certainly natural disasters are disruptive and traumatic life events. Uh, to suddenly uh, lose your home, your savings, family heirlooms, um, or even the lives of loved ones has devastating impacts on survivors' mental health. When this trauma is left unaddressed, survivors can develop drastic mental health consequences. In fact, experiencing a natural disaster by age five is associated with 6%, a 16% increase in mental health or substance use issues in adulthood. Again, experiencing a natural disaster by age five is associated with a 16% increase and a mental health or substance use issues in adulthood. A large scale study of earthquake survivors found that one in four had PTSD. Fortunately, uh, Administrator FEMA already does have a program in place that assists territories and tribes after a disaster to address the immediate mental health impacts. Administrator Criswell, can you please tell us what the crisis counseling program is? and how FEMA has worked with localities to help survivors in communities across the country. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. You know, our mental health is so important, both for disaster survivors, as well as I stress it for my employees as well. And our crisis counseling program is definitely a tool that is available to help disaster survivors manage the stress and cope with the losses that they've experienced from this disaster. It's a program that's available under the individual assistance program when that is authorized for a major disaster declaration and executed by the state. Um, really important resource available to help the individuals that have been impacted by a disaster. Thank you. Uh, and I thank you also for including your staff in that. We have to heal the healers as well. Uh, this life-saving program uh, has been deployed nationwide in response to the COVID-19 pandemic in Puerto Rico following hurricanes Irma and Maria and in New York following the September 11th terrorist attacks to name a few. However, there are many people who survive disasters from terrorist attacks to mass violence and natural disasters that can't take advantage of this program. At Minister Criswell, can you, uh, as you know, there are two types of disaster declarations, uh, major disasters and emergency declarations. Is the crisis counseling program currently available following emergency declarations? Congressman, Congresswoman, no, it is not currently available for emergency declarations. Okay, well, I, I'd like to um, you know, implore you uh, to make that change. I think it should be available. Uh, under both declarations. Over the last decade alone, there have been more than 4,000 emergency declarations in the United States. Now I represent Boston and the Boston Marathon attack, um, you know, the, the, the ripple effect of, of that trauma, uh, some, was it, some of it was immediately manifesting, um, uh, but some manifested later. And I think it's time to ensure survivors of all Disasters can access counseling and be connected to long-term mental health services. I appreciate your agency has worked with me already on my proposal to expand the program to emergency declarations and that FEMA does not foresee any hindrances to providing crisis counseling to help more people. Um, we would love to follow up with you beyond this hearing and uh, would love to hear your response to that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we would be happy to continue providing technical drafting assistance on making that change 
um, again, so important that we're taking care of the mental health of those people that have been impacted by these traumatic events. Well, I did also want to, because I always seek to engage those closest to the pain, um, Manya Chalinsky, who's a survivor of the Boston Marathon bombing, she shared her story and named that she wishes the assistance provided under the crisis counseling program had existed for her uh, eight years ago. So it really is time again to ensure that survivors of all disasters can access counseling and be connected to long-term mental health services. So we look forward to being in touch with you about that. And with the little time I have remaining, if you could respond to, um, you know, what are the provisions and what are the plans for those that are disabled, um, those that are incarcerated and those that are hospitalized uh, when it comes to a major disaster or an emergency declaration. Are there any protocols in place, any plans? Um, I don't know that I'm understanding specifically what you're asking, but um, our disaster response programs, when we respond to incidents, it's to help all people that have been impacted by those disasters. Um, we do have an entire unit here that focuses on the planning and preparedness for individuals with disabilities. And we work closely with our state partners through our regional offices to understand the unique situations within each of the communities once a disaster has happened, like those that may have been incarcerated. Okay. All right, well, we'll follow up on that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. General Lady yields back. And, and without objection, Mr. Troy Carter from Louisiana, is authorized to participate in today's uh, hearing. Mr. Carter's uh, Louisiana was greatly impacted by Ida. You are now recognized, Mr. Carter. Chairman Maloney, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing. As a non-member, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to present. On August 29th, Hurricane Ida made landfall as a category four, four hurricane and sustained winds of 150 miles per hour. Coastal Louisiana experienced 16 foot storm surges and significant flash flooding, uh, 16 years to the day, 16 years to the day of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, of course, the federal government made substantial uh, investments in shoring up our levee system, and it made a big difference in this, uh, in this hurricane. And we're hopeful that going forward under Build Back Better and other resources will do the same, like burying our, our grid to make sure that people never have to suffer um, weeks of being without power. Um, it's uh, very difficult in the sweltering months of August uh, to be without power for senior citizens, for people with disabilities, for our young people. Uh, it, it, uh, it adds insult to injury. And so we're hopeful that as we build back better, we, we continue to build on mistakes of the past. We know hurricanes come every year. We don't know the name yet. We may not know the intensity, but we know that with climate change, warmer waters bring stronger storms. Um, and we should endeavor to do better than we did from previous years as we did after Katrina. Administrator Griswold, I wanna thank you, President Biden, Senior Advisor Richmond, for coming to my district, to coming, for coming to Louisiana, um, walking the streets of the community and seeing firsthand. I cannot tell you how much that meant to the people of Louisiana to have you on the ground to see firsthand the level of de de devastation. Hurricane Ida caused major damage in my district and communities across Louisiana, devastating homes, knocking out the electric grid and leaving trails of damage along the Gulf Coast. There are two points I'd like to get across quickly before my time elapses. The storm showed the value of federal investments in protecting communities. Uh, area like New Orleans and the river parishes. Storms and flood protection systems stay dry after the investments after Katrina. Um, we know now we have to do better going forward to make sure that these communities uh, are weatherproofed for the future. Having lived through my fair share of storms, I've seen recoveries that work and recoveries that don't. The biggest factor in recovery is how fast we get money back into the pockets and start uh, people getting back to some semblance of normalcy with their lives. We need federal recovery process that recognizes this. Far too many of our programs takes months to kick in. So turning to my question, as a part of the FEMA recovery, uh, you instituted several policies and granted waivers for um, people that um, mischeck the box. Um, and uh, as a result, many people were denied, I should say, for mis mischecking the box. What can we do to create a 
uh, an appeal process. So a person that may have made an innocent mistake or accident in their filing are not summarily rejected. Uh, Congressman, I, the program that we implemented that you're talking about is our Critical Needs Assistance Program, and it's an amazing tool that helps us get money in the hands of survivors quickly. Um, and we were able to get money out into the hands of survivors faster than we have in any other disaster. And we did hear that some individuals were having some difficulties with uh, how they answered the questions. And so we did go back and take a look at what we were using as criteria to approve those for uh, critical needs assistance. And we were able to give funding to an additional 120,000 um, families. We are now taking a look at our systems to see if there's anything else we can do to improve that moving forward, um, as we're always trying to improve the delivery of our services to help give money to those that are eligible for it. And, and I wanna take time to thank you too, because you and your people have been incredible. We've challenged you in every possible way. We've pushed the envelope to try and make things more seamless for the people. Um, and we've been on the one yard line of FEMA um, to make sure they do that. And I wanna thank you as well as your, your people on the ground for doing a great job in that regard. Real quickly, uh, Blue Roofs, um, the Blue Roof program, uh, while it's very effective, can you share with me ways or things that you're putting in place to advance or move them more quickly? As you know, we continue to have rain and the ability to mitigate the existing damages would be very helpful if we could do it faster. Okay, the gentleman's time has expired, but you may answer his question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Congressman, the Blue Roof Program is a partnership um, with FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers, and it's a great program to provide some temporary repairs to homes, as you know. Um, I did speak with Lieutenant General Spellman directly to talk about the status of the program, um, and he has assured me that he's made some improvements into how they're executing their mission. Um, and I think from the, the numbers that I had seen, they've already um, significantly increased the number of Blue Roofs that they've installed. Um, but I'll tell you that that's never fast enough. Um, and I am pushing um, our people as well as the Army Corps to continue to find ways to get those on the homes as quickly as possible so we can get people back into their homes sooner. Thank, Thank you. you. I now recognize Mr. Higgins for a closing statement. Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Administrator Criswell, thank you for being here today. We have more work to do. My office will be delivering a letter uh, to, to you and your senior staff by the close of business today, documenting specific urgent requests to FEMA on behalf of, of my constituency who has been suffering for uh, over a year from Hurricanes Laura and Delta. I'd, I'd like your personal commitment, ma'am, that, that, that you will receive our letter and and be involved. You've been you've been very gracious today and professional, and I thank you for that. So I'm going to lean on you for for a commitment to personal involvement in the letter that that we deliver today. And and finally, um, regarding rural areas and small towns, I, I I beg of you, madam, to let's make sure that that our small towns, rural areas, poor communities get adequate attention and compassionate response that they don't get left behind. Uh, can I get your commitment on, on uh, receiving our letter documenting specific requests, urgent requests, and, and can I get a commitment that our rural areas and poor communities don't get overlooked and left behind? Congressman Higgins, you have my commitment to be personally involved um, in that response to your letter. Um, and I'd like to thank you and Congressman Carter for your leadership in supporting the people that have been impacted by these recent events in Louisiana. Thank you, ma'am. And, and uh, to my colleague, uh, Representative Carter, he's done an, an amazing uh, compliment to the Louisiana delegation. I commend him for the work that he does and continues to do. He had big shoes to fill with our friend and colleague, uh, Congressman Richmond, is now in the White House as a senior advisor. We, we, have, we are Louisiana strong in Congress and in the White House, so we are joined together. Madam Chair, thank you for your gracious, uh, for your, your, your gracious allowances of time during this hearing. Thank you very much, Madam, I yield. Gentleman yields back, and I now recognize myself. In closing, I wanna thank Administrator uh, Criswell for testifying today and thank you and all the FEMA employees who are working tirelessly 
to respond to disasters around the country and really visiting the sites personally to oversee and help. I want to emphasize that survivors of Hurricane Ida, as well as previous disasters, still need help. They need to know how to apply for financial assistance. They need clear information about what qualifies for assistance, and they need quick processing of their responses. Administrator, I appreciate the commitment that you made today with, to work with all communities to up, update their flood maps so that they can be more accurate with community input. I also think it's important to emphasize your, test, your testimony that communities can apply for FEMA grant money to invest in mitigation, even when they are in an area that has not been declared a disaster. As we heard from you today, Administrator, we need to invest in climate resilient infrastructure, ensuring that we are investing in frontline communities who are disproportionately impacted by severe weather. I urge all of my colleagues to support the Federal Agency Climate Prep Act, the bill I introduced today that would ensure that the federal government has a comprehensive plan to tackle climate change coordinated by the White House and in partnership with local communities. I, I also call on my colleagues to support the Build Back Better Act, which would make critical investments to upgrade our infrastructure so that we can be better prepared for future disasters. Uh, these investments are, are critical so that states and local governments are not left dealing with the immense cost of recovering from disasters on their own. In closing, I wanna thank all of our panelists for their remarks, and I want to commend my colleagues for participating. With that, and without objection, all members have five legislative days within which to submit materials and to submit additional written questions for the witness to the chair, which will be forwarded to her for her response. I ask our witness uh, to please respond as promptly as you're able. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you so much to everyone who participated. Adjourned.